So I want to invite on the stage my beautiful wife. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome <laughs> Pastor Mildred. <laughs> Hallelujah. What we're going to share is uh, we're going to run through some agreements we had before we got married or, or some inside marriage that has really helped us. Um, I, I have a great sweet marriage today, but I want to attribute it to the, the kind of partner that I married. If you're a young person, that's the strongest thing you can do to get a good marriage is the choice of who you do marriage with. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? You can't pick a weak team and act surprised. Okay, you guys are Scotland now, so you, are, you should be in the UK. You are footballing people. Man City is beating Man U, has beating Man U today. Now, yes, I'm a Man City fan. I'm a Man City fan. So, you're a footballing nation. That's why there are only some countries that generally win the World Cup. Because that World Cup has been won from team selection. Africans like us will pray on the stadium. We pray before the match, after the match. We don't understand that prayer cannot cancel your selection. A good marriage starts by selection. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? He said two cannot work together except they be what? Agreed. And these are a few things we agreed about before we started our marriage. Very important. As we were flying, we were flying Qatar Airways to UK, this trip. And when we sat on the plane, there's a demarcation on between the two chairs. Just in case both of you are not traveling together, you can have your privacy. So we had to call the attendant and say, how can we bring this barricade down, you know, so that we can be seeing ourselves. And um, the woman came and showed us and said, both of you need to press the button down button at the same time for it to go down. Oh, we said, that's great. Then we asked, how do we raise it up? She said, only one person can press the up button and to raise it up. And that quickly dawned on me that it takes two intentional people to build a marriage. It takes only one to scatter it. Only one. So it doesn't matter how good you are. There are very good people who are always shocked that their marriage didn't work. It's not about you. You know you can be a great driver and still have an accident. Because the, mad, the other person driving can be mad. Has nothing to do with you. You are obeying all the rules, but that's not what guarantees success. You must choose the right person as a team. Somebody get what I'm saying? Because many good people are always crying. Oh, Pastor, I'm so good. I'm so loving. I do everything right, except choosing right. <laughs> Two intentional people. We must both press it at the same time for intimacy to be built. But to create the wall, I must still be still good. Once they are no more good, the wall is there. So that shows you how important it is to pick right. All right. So I do want that starts. Are you sure? So we're looking at about 10 things. We'll run through them very quickly. That has helped us in our own marriage. Agreements we had when we're starting. Number one agreement we had. Very interesting. When we're dating, we agreed that if at any time on this journey to the marriage, to the wedding, if you decide or believe that we are not meant for each other, we'll back down without any animosity or anger. Do you understand? We started a relationship, but it's with the clause that if at any time in this journey to that wedding, if you feel this is not it, feel free to back down. Nobody will be, nobody will be offended. That's part of how you know healthy self-esteem. The way some people beg other people, please don't leave me. If you leave me, I will die. You must marry me. It shows something is wrong. Because marriage is not for two getters, it's for two givers. If you're having that mindset, it means you are coming to suck the life out of the other person. And what you don't realize, when you beg for love, the people you are begging don't even value themselves as much as you do. So when they see, they, they, they even have a lower esteem of themselves. When they see that you are willing to die to be with them, they're saying, look, if I'm filled, I'm this low. And you feel I'm this much. How low are you? That's why begging for love never works. Nobody has successfully begged for love. Not for long. The best you can get out of begging is pity. Not love. I've not seen anybody that said, oh, my husband begged me. <laughs> and he's begging, he's still begging now. And we have been begging for 20 years. Never. Along the line, someone is going to change into resentment. So we agreed that, look, if at any time you feel this is not it, we will not be angry. Everybody will back Even if it's on the wedding day. If we have not joined ourselves on the wedding day, if you feel this is not it, Call me and we'll cut, break it. Because we both came with that healthy idea that I'm not, I'm not useless without you. Is somebody get what I'm saying? Yeah. You know some people back for this marriage, you know that their, their own life is so horrible, they are so tired, they, are, they don't like themselves at all. 
that I'm so dead. If you don't marry me, I'm finished. Who will I, who am I without you? Eh? Marriage won't give you what you don't have. This is why you now marry the person. You are now pressuring the person to become something because you didn't have a life. You must have a life. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? The Bible says that a, a man that is full, loaded honey, or he even despises honey. He said, but to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. So when you come into love, empty and hungry, anybody that says I love you will be confused. Any offer is good. When you have self-esteem and self-value, you are very selective about who you decide to go on the journey with. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So our first agreement we had was that if at any time you're no more happy with this thing we're doing as a relationship, we can cut it off. Without animosity, no quarrel, no stalking, no hate mail, no status, no updating your status. <laughs> you know when some girls have broken up. They start writing in parables. Don't trust any man. Trust is end and not... You start writing... You know somebody has broken up with somebody. <laughs> Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you all here. And it's good to be here. <laughs> I had a great time this morning with Bishop Francis. Well, it's good to be here. Um, so I'll just get right into it because Pastor K has already talked one full hour. I don't know how he does it. Let me just introduce books two hours ago. Um, okay, so yes, that's our first agreement. Second agreement was, um, if we now do make it into the marriage, divorce was not an option. So we only had up till the day we were getting married to decide whether we we're going to walk away or not. That when we now get into the marriage, there was no way out. That's how we saw it. Um, and that's because even in counseling, uh, you know, I still share with couples, when we counsel couples, we tell them, we ask them a simple question when they come in with all their issues. We say, if you are in a room like this room and there are no windows and there are no doors and a fire breaks out here, what will you do? If you think about it, the first thing you do is try to put out the fire because there's no way of escape. But if that same fire breaks out and there are windows and there are doors, there will be a stampede because you won't think of trying to put out the fire you're just going to think of how to get out and how to get out first. And you don't care who you trample on to get out. So for us, we decided and we made up our minds that in our minds, we're going to take out all windows and all doors. So whatever the issue is, we are going to try to fix it. So not only is divorce not an option, mentioning divorce is not an option. Threatening each other with divorce is not an option. In fact, divorce is a taboo word in our marriage. We don't joke with it. We don't play around it. We don't even, it's not, it's not even a thought. So no matter the, what we're going through, we have to find a way around it. And the truth is that our marriage has had many challenges. There were times when we couldn't even afford to eat. But we knew that divorce was not an option. We were going to have to find a way. And I didn't start blaming him and thinking, oh, look at you, your mates are providing for No, because he's not my source. God is my source. And I'm not invalid. If he doesn't bring money, what's wrong with me? Why can't I bring money? You know, so we had to, we, we, we always understood that there's no way out of this. So whenever there's a challenge, we have to fix it. When we got married, we didn't have our children on time. He didn't now, even though it was my fault because of my health. So before we got married, I already knew I was not going to be able to have children. Doctors had told me, and not one doctor, not two, not three. So this was something that I already knew. But when, I, when he proposed, I told him, and he made up his mind that he was in love and was ready to go the journey with me. And when we got into the marriage, first eight years, it didn't happen. He didn't say, oh, I'm out. And at some point, I was even feeling bad for him because ah, I'm wasting your time. You know, we've been here for eight years. By now, your first child should be planning to finish primary school. You know, but he, he didn't because we understood that we, once you've gotten into it, this is our decision for life. So that's one agreement we had. And no matter the challenge, we we're going to face it together. And divorce was not an option. Yeah. And if, if you are dating someone now and they're always threatening you with a breakup, that person will continue to threaten you with a divorce. Again, this is why the first agreement is important. You must come from a healthy point of view. Once you act like the person is doing you a favor, one person is already underhanded in the relationship. So you're already dating now in a courtship now and the person is always saying, I'll break up with you. Or they break up with you every two weeks. 
That's not normal. Because that's the, some people don't know that their normal is not normal. He said, oh, it's normal. It happens in every marriage. No, it doesn't. It happens in every relationship. No, it doesn't. It's not usual for two people that are supposed to be in love and supposed to be committed to each other to be threatening each other with living. So I'm going to leave this marriage. So that's not normal. So it's very important that you note it. If you're dating and it happened, or you're married and happening, if you're married and it's happening, you need to stop from today. Stop telling your partner you will leave. Because one day, you either leave or they will leave. Or they will stop you from leaving. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> they will stop you from leaving L-I-V-I-N-G. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you need to understand what I'm saying. All right? Third thing we agreed about was that we would always have a joint account or joint accountability. Since we got married, we've never had a separate account. So I don't understand why a couple will be married and still be living like they're single. That's what many couples are doing. They are married, but they're still living like two separate people. All they are sharing is a bed. Oh, that didn't sink. Let me look at this other side. I say all they are sharing is a bed. They are not sharing their plans. They are not sharing their thoughts. They are not sharing their money. All they are sharing is the bed. That's not the idea of marriage. The Bible said two shall become one. It doesn't make sense if two is remaining as two. God designed it that you will have joint account. When I say joint accountability, what that means is that in case you have a work account or something that you can't have two people on, everything going on in that account is transparent and open for your partner to see and is a part of it. And whoever is earning more is not superior to the person earning less. Doesn't mean you make more decisions now because you earn more. Doesn't mean you're a higher member of the, or citizen of the family. Is somebody getting this? This is the design. And I understand in contemporary marriages, they don't like that. Yeah. They say, no, let's separate all our money. We are two people. In case you run away, I don't trust my husband, I don't trust my wife. The real issue is not the money. The issue is why would you marry someone you don't trust? Yeah. That's the real discussion. And it shows your value system has problems. Because you are very comfortable with giving your life to someone, but keeping your money safe. It means you don't know what has value and what doesn't have value. It's your life that should be in the safe. Your money, you can get your money back. But you are keeping your money in the safe and putting your life at risk. You are giving your life to someone that you can't give your money to. It shows something is wrong with your value system. You are dealing with financial trauma. Because people that are really hungry and suffering, they value money more than, more than life. Because the first person that can kill you, the easiest person to kill you, is who you are married to. One drop of something in your tea, in your coffee, in your food. They can press you with pillow at night. You're already at risk. One of my favorite things I watch on TV is um, American Crime Channel. The real ones, not the acted ones, the real crimes that they investigate. I've watched that thing so much. Right now, I feel like LAPD. Yeah. <laughs> I feel I'm a detective with American with, uh, with, with Houston police. Because I, I, I've watched it so much, I know all the questions to ask. I know how to investigate it. Even if see, somebody dies around you, call me. <laughs> Before you call police. I can investigate it. I know the job so much. Once a married person dies, the number one suspect is their spouse. And those guys, those police, the detective will just come. He will have his badge here. They don't wear uniform, you know now. We don't wear uniform. <laughs> <laughs> our badge will be one of these things, our pocket here. We will just come and say, hi, um, this is Special Detective Kingsley. <laughs> we are so sorry about uh, the death of your partner. So why are you crying? <laughs> we are so sorry about what happened. When I say, where were you by 3 p.m. today? <laughs> because you are the number one suspect. We are still crying, you know. But where were you by 3 p.m.? You say I was in the office. Say, is there someone that can verify that? Yeah. Why you are talking, they've called their office. They're checking CCTV to be sure whether you were there by 3 p.m. So they know that the number one suspect is your spouse. And many times that spouse is involved. To show how warped your value system is, not even just money. You can trust your children with this person. But your money is in safe. That means you still value money more than human life. Something is very wrong with you. You need therapy. So we always agreed that money will never be an issue. Marry somebody you trust. I still jokingly tell my wife, and it's purely joke, it can never happen. I say, even if forever, eh, you decide to leave ourselves, eh, 
I said, I will still trust you with the money. Please, be, you'll be distributing the money for all of us, <laughs> me and the children, because you're still way a better manager. Is <laughs> somebody get what I'm saying? You should be that comfortable. We've always had a joint account from day one, and it has helped because one of the things that separates a couple is money. Once your money is separate, your thoughts will be separate, your plans will be separate. If your money is together, you can't plan apart. There are sometimes, as a pastor, I'm talking to the husband. I say, will you be around for midweek service? He said, no, sir, I'm traveling on Tuesday. Midweek service is Wednesday. I'm just going to travel on Tuesday. I said, okay, no problem. When you come back, let me know. I will now tell the wife that, um, will, you, will you be around or you two are traveling? She will say, traveling. She said, we are not traveling. I said, your husband is traveling on Tuesday. She says, no, he's not. I say, he is. <laughs> the wife doesn't know that he's traveling because he has accounts he can control by himself. If they are doing joint accounts, there's no way they, they will, you can't make plans outside of your partner. Putting your money together forces you to talk, forces you to plan, and when one of you want to make a stupid decision, the other one is a sense of reasoning. Many of you don't know your money personality. When you're single, you don't know whether you are good with money or not. Marry first. And you have to defend every project. <laughs> then you will know whether you are good. <laughs> and whether what you want to buy makes sense. I need to buy this shoe. Why? It's just a, it's on sale. When you start having to defend your decisions, you will now know that a lot of the decisions you are making doesn't make sense. Is somebody get what I'm saying? So joint account, joint accountability helps your management, helps your faith. There's an exercise we do with couples sometimes. I was telling Pastor about that we're going to do it. Maybe sometime we'll come again. Um, there are financial exercises every couple should do. One of it is goal setting. On that one is that we interview couples. We give them a piece of paper and say, look, if you receive one million pounds or 500 pounds or 100,000 pounds, what are you going to do with it? And we tell the man to write, tell the man to write, and we now ask them which other. In fact, some of them, they don't talk. Some don't know what their husband is going to do if he has 100,000 pounds. They don't know what the wife is going to do if he has. So they don't talk. They don't plan. You must have clear agreements financially. And running your money together is definitely one of the strongest things you can do as a couple. Because every decision somehow tallies back to money. Please be sure you're marrying someone you can trust when it comes to money. It's very important. And um, also understand your money personalities because me, I saw Shige. Yes, sir. <laughs> We've shared the story. Let me just say my own. <laughs> yes, sir. But yes. I thank God because if we didn't have joint accounts, I wouldn't know how bad he was with money. Mm -hmm. I would always assume he had money. And I think sometimes that's the problem in some marriages where the man thinks the woman is always asking for money because she doesn't know what you have. She thinks you have, you are not telling her. If she sees clearly that you don't have, what is she going to ask for? Yes, do you Something think it's a joke that, that Jesus gave Judas the money to handle? <laughs> Limit your stealing. Yes. Yeah, it's with you. It's like steal everything. <laughs> so it's important that you guys understand and talk about your money personalities. I think that's what joint account does for you. You have to talk. talk and plan. It just, it, you, know, you just have to talk. Which takes me to our next but agreement. You that, please, if you know you have married a troublesome person already. Aha. Uh -huh. You can Let's be careful now. Yes. We understand that we're not oblivious to the fact that some yeah. of you have already entered with yeah. a, so the wrong kind of person. Necessary. So the person is reckless and putting the family at risk. Mm -hmm. So I get that. So in those kind of cases, you might need to get the wisdom of God. She did some things when I was financially reckless that now saved us. So you need to get the wisdom of God also how to navigate. You know that the person you've married, before the money comes, they have gone to bet, bet where they bet to finish the money. In those kind of cases, you might need to rescue the family, okay? Or uh -huh. buy your necessary things. Yes, yeah, so because betting might not be the issue. Yes, I'm just it using betting as a or necessary things. things. Yeah, no, necessary. Like them things them. that's very unnecessary <laughs> that they Wait, will be defending. Is, is snooker board unnecessary? They will defend it. Pastor, she explain snooker. Is it unnecessary? So snooker like a dog, board. The dog I bought. Wait, wait. Snooker board. I bought board. two dogs on our wedding day. Is that unnecessary? <laughs> <laughs> two dogs. Dog lovers know what I'm talking about. I didn't want to buy one because the other one will be lonely. Lonely. <laughs> so I have to buy two. I was a financial wreck, uh, trust me. We'll share the story on that. Uh, <laughs> let's not go into that today. <laughs> yeah. But thank God, because if not, I would think we have money and we, yes. and we didn't have. So yes, it's good so. that we had a joint account so I could see and track the spending and correct what I needed to correct. Okay, so our next, um, our next agreement was based off of communication. Okay, I'll give you a background before I tell you what the agreement was. So the first, So this agreement came in the first few months of our marriage. Um, so when we got married, I had this, before, before I got married, I had this bad habit of when I'm upset, I sulk. I'll just be quiet and, you know, just implode. I don't discuss it. If you ask me what's wrong, I'll say nothing. 
you know, but I would just be carrying, you know, I would just be carrying on what we call in Nigeria, carrying face. You know, just be carrying face. The person say, what's wrong? You say nothing. Good morning. Do you want to eat? But you're not talking, you know. You're just, you're just walking about with that attitude. So, first couple of months, I can't honestly, I'm sure it was nothing. Because me too. It's not like I'm okay like that. It's, I, it was nothing. It can't be anything serious. That's my point. Because I used to be very petty. So, any small thing would get me, because I'm also a perfectionist, so any small thing would get me upset. You know, and we share these things honestly to show you that we're real people. So if we can, if you can do it, you can. You can have a great marriage, okay? If you obey God's principles, there's no, there's no superstar, there's no secret here, right? So I can't remember what he did, but I started doing that thing. I started soaking. So I just carry my face. You know, what will you eat? Your food is on the table. He asked me what's wrong. I'll say nothing. Or do you think there's something wrong? He will say something happened. No, did you do something? I was just doing all those kind of, you know, those kind of things. And he, his heart was free. He didn't even notice he did anything. But then I noticed something. In that period, I was carrying my face and frowning and doing all kinds of things. I noticed that he would wake up in the morning and he would be praying really loudly. He would pray very loud. He would be singing worship off cue, but he would be singing it, you know, really annoying. You, almost like when somebody's doing it to annoy you. So the thing was really getting to me. So after a few days, I think it was like the third day, I couldn't take it anymore. And I went to meet him and I said, I feel like you're very wicked. And I was like, wicked? I said, yes, you offended me and you are praying and singing. And Who is answering that prayer? Even the scripture is clear on how you deal with people when you've offended them. Ah, he opened his eyes. I've never seen him so shocked in his life. He looked at me and was like, is that what that was? He thought I was being sober and vigilant and meditating and he was feeling challenged so he said i honestly thought you were you know trying to study what i'm and i was challenged that this girl cannot come to my house and now be oppressing me spiritually i'm the spiritual head here so that's why he was praying more and worshiping and be oh my god and so after we had that conversation we both agreed right be honest i just came to the conclusion that men they are not like they are not they are not like that Men, I'm telling you. If I, I always say, now nah, men didn't they? they? That was the day I came to that conclusion. Then how can you not know that you've offended me? How can you think that I'm being sober and vigilant? How does that even add up? <laughs> but honestly, you know what touched me was his sincerity. He was very sincere about it. That he was challenged. And he was like, this guy can't come to my house and be more spiritual than me. So he was praying more. Praying louder, worshiping more. It was really very annoying, you know. So we came to the conclusion that if there's a problem, you don't soak, you talk. Because communication is the life of any relationship. So if something's upsetting, you open your mouth and just tell me. And you know, especially women, I need to say this. I know there are some men, there are also exceptions to every rule, but women especially do this. We are very guilty of it. When you're upset, with something, and your husband says, what is it? Don't say nothing. Because when you say nothing, he believes you. He actually believes it's nothing, and he moves on. But in the world of women, we know that nothing means ask me more. <laughs> Try harder, press more, so that you can find out what is really going on. But the average man, when you say nothing, he believes you, and he moves on. So all those things you are doing, you come, you say nothing, but you bang the pot, you hit the table, you... And he's like, what is it? You say nothing. He will increase the volume of the TV <laughs> because you're banging and everything is disturbing him. And you are angry because why are you doing that? You're not even paying attention. You just said nothing was wrong. Why are you disturbing someone who nothing is wrong with? So women, I always like to say this. We need to understand that men don't read minds. They read newspapers. So if you want something, open your mouth and say it. Even dropping hints does not work. If you want something on your birthday, two weeks before your birthday, you tell your husband, I really like this bag my friend is carrying. I would like one for my birthday. Now, in the world of women, we understand that when we say, oh, I love um, these shoes, your friend will just mark it and say, ah, she likes that shoe. That means her next birthday, I'm going to buy it for her. You don't need to tell me more than that. But men are not like that. They are literal beings. So you say, I like this shoe. I want it for my birthday. 
Then you have to remind them. One week to your birthday, you come back again and say, remember those shoes? Honey, I still want them for my birthday this year. Because we say birthday, it can mean... Men, am I helping? So you say, I did it for my birthday this year. A few days to your birthday, three days, send him a picture by WhatsApp and say, I'm expecting to receive this from you on my birthday this year. No. The day before, remind him that, honey, I know this year will be special because you got the bag I wanted for my birthday this year. Then when he brings it, he may not remember to wrap it because you did not tell him to wrap it. When he brings it, don't say you could not even wrap it. Don't be angry. Just collect it and say, oh my God, you shouldn't have. Oh. And you even took the stress off me. I don't have to even untie the wrappings. Thank you, baby. Yeah, you take it. Next year, you say that bag you bought for me last year, I want matching shoes wrapped. Do you understand? You have to educate. That's how you do it. Because men don't read minds, they read newspapers. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> okay, next one here. This is number what, guys? Five. Five. Um, we also agreed earlier on, early on, that no secrets, no passwords, no hidden things. Um, no relationship can really be solid without trust. And secrets generally breeds distrust. Many tension in homes are because they've never built trust. Very important. In, in most traditional marriages, you will hear men saying things like, women, leave our phone. What can possibly be in the phone? That needs hiding. That means you don't understand how marriage works. The Bible said they were both naked. The man and his wife. And they were not ashamed. So it's important that there's honesty. There's transparency. We had an agreement, no password. So we've always had each other's passwords. Each other's emails. Each other's, our social media is even on each other's phone. It helps, especially if you are a public person, a public figure, or a popular person, or somebody out there in the public. It's important you have that transparency. Most men don't understand how women's minds work. A woman's mind is very imaginative. So she called you three times, you didn't pick. And you don't reply or return the call or even send a text that I'm in a meeting, I'll call you after. Nothing, you just don't pick. You are the one looking for trouble. Because her mind will go all over Scotland. Where has he gone? He has gone to marry another person. I knew it. <laughs> it's important there's transparency at all times. Especially for those people that have even uh, gone astray before. It's important you do video calls regularly. <laughs> Anytime you are missing for a long time, do video calls, show where you are. <laughs> say, you, won't not, you won't say it, all, but you know why. Say, see where I am, oh, and with uh, Michael Kunayo, and with Pastor Shekun, see everybody beside me. Pastor Shekun, say hi. Say hi. Say this. Say this. We are all here. Everything is okay. Fine. She didn't ask you, but you're already answering the unasked question. That's how you are a smart man. So keep your um, demos of transparency. So having password that your wife doesn't know is the height of distrust. And I don't know why you think that's slick. That's, that's already made you a suspect. You are going to have your bath. You are carrying your phone to the bathroom. You're already a suspect. You're already a criminal. You're already charged. Guilty as charged. My, wife's, my social media is on my wife's phone. And there are times as a pastor, I receive weird messages. One lady sent me a message and said, Pastor, I need prayer. I need your help. I said, what's the problem? She said, my, 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 my nipple has refused to go down. It has been standing since and it has been paining me. As she was sending that I called my wife, say, check, check, check DM. There's something interesting. There. Because she has my social media on her phone. I say, check, check, see. It was a joking matter between us because she too was reading the chat. Imagine if there was no transparency. Sometimes Satan will target your weak seasons. And everybody has weak seasons. When they are tired, they are not as agile as a lot. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So a lot of the problems crisis will face in their marriage are they are hiding things. 
don't hide things. If there's total transparency, it's even difficult for you to cheat on your spouse. Yeah. Yeah. If, you, if you know you can't even trust yourself, let your WhatsApp be open on her own device. Let your phone be so that as you are booking an appointment for the hotel, she will be the one to meet you. <laughs> your wife will meet you there. <laughs> Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So we agreed from because so we've never had passwords. All these things that many couples fight about that uh, he didn't see my phone, he didn't see my phone. Nah. In fact, sometimes we exchange phones to catch up on gist because we can't remember all the things that happened all the day. So we just exchange phones and say, okay, hey, what did you anticipate? So, but well, that's, that's how we catch up because to remember all the gist is hard. But it gives you freedom, gives you peace. But if you're hiding your phone, then you're already a suspect, you're guilty as charged. Something is wrong with that, with the trust in that relationship. If somebody has to hide information. If somebody get what I'm saying. Yeah. Again, this is kingdom marriage principle. And I didn't make this up. It's there in the Bible. They were both naked and not ashamed. So uh, traditional marriage doesn't like that. Contemporary marriage doesn't like that. Say, he, he, it's my privacy. Yeah. Inside marriage. <laughs> There's no privacy. They use naked and not ashamed because that's your most private part. It's just a symbolism of the fact that you should have nothing to hide between two of you. So traditional marriage wants to cover phone. Contemporary marriage doesn't say, it's our privacy. You do you. I do me. It's not kingdom marriage. In kingdom marriage, two of you are one. And it's not only men that need it to. Some women. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Because some women, as they are dating a guy, they are keeping their options open. So they have many toasters. Many guys in their DM. Many guys they are chatting with. And when they get married, it doesn't concern those men. They are still chatting you up. And the girl is still answering. So transparency will even save you. From temptations. Yeah. Okay. All those messages as well. So, <laughs> uh, my eyes have seen things. So, um, so we, another agreement that we had um, that has really helped us was that we we exchanged parents. So, because we understood that marriage is a covenant, it means that we are one. So, what we did when we got married was that we agreed that we're going to exchange parents. From now on, my parents are your parents, your parents are mine. So I'm responsible for taking care of your parents, you're responsible for taking care of mine. So that also eliminated things like partiality, eliminated things like, oh, you did this for your mother. Your mother is not my mother. So I'm doing what, what I want to do for your mom. You have to do the same for my mom. So, and <laughs> for us, to be honest, it was, well, maybe not for us. For me, it was a bit hard. When, because that agreement, even though we had that agreement, um, from my first encounter with my mother-in-law wasn't good. She didn't like me, um, and she didn't hide it. So ex now taking her on as my mom was a true test of character building. You know, you have to walk in love. You have to be patient. You have to be kind. You have to do for her even when she doesn't appreciate it, even when she thinks you are a disturbance, she doesn't want you here. She does. So it, it really helped to strengthen our, my character. You know, um, for Pastor K, Pastor K and my mom are kind of alike, so it was very easy for them to, they're both bubbly, both happy people, both, you know. So my mom is dancing, is dancing. I'm like, you guys, please go to that side, <laughs> you know. But it really helped um, us bond because we didn't have any of those, your people, my people, because his people are now my people, my people are now his people. So it really helped us um, in terms of bonding. Um, another thing that it really helped us to do was, even though we agreed to exchange parents, we also had the agreement that when there's a crisis, you address your parents. So for instance, if I had a challenge with his mom, I only did positive things with her. I always did the gift giving, always did the birthday thing and anything pleasant. When it was unpleasant, he would have to address her because he has more goodwill with her. And so when he says, mommy, I don't like what you're doing, she's not going to be as offended. The day I'll tell her, mommy, I don't like what you're doing is the day I'm going back to my father's house. <laughs> and there's no road to that place anymore. They've blocked it. So, you know, we had to also put that caveat because um, if, if we didn't do that, it would be unrealistic because there would be times when in-laws can kind of overstep their boundaries. So you have to be able to keep them in check. So that was the one major agreement that we had that's helped us still today. Hmm. And please take note of the fact that when there's a crisis, you address your own biological parents. You have enough emotional bank deposits with them for them not to be permanently angry. All right? Very important. So like she said, the first time my mom met her, my mom didn't treat her well at all. 
my mom sent her home uh, because we were at home watching a movie together or something. And my mom came and said, you know, Mom Shaw was very harsh on her. I just went and dropped her. And when I got back, I had to call my mom and be like, you do not talk to her like that. If you have any issues, talk to me. You can't address her like that. So I had to draw the line. So if a man, it's important you are able to defend your wife. Same thing with you as a wife. Defend your husband in front of your family members. The Bible says, you therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. Too many boys always ask me that if my mother wants something and my wife wants something, what should I do? <laughs> That's traditional marriage or contemporary marriage. Kingdom marriage, our terms and conditions are spelled out. You will leave father and mother and cleave. It's all spelled out. It's all in the Bible. We're not making it up. It's there. Leave doesn't mean you abandon your parents. It just means in order of priority. Before now, it used to be your parents. But now that you are married, the family you build is more important than the family you are from. Did you understand? Mm. So your wife comes first. She's one with you. You leave father and mother. You must defend your, your, parent, your, your wife in front of your parents. So don't say I'm neutral. I don't know what to do. I don't, know. I don't want to choose sides. And you, you, you went to carry somebody from her house to marry her. You said you don't want to choose sides. You have already chosen sides. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Very important. Number what? Seven, we're about to close. Number seven, we agreed that there will be no quarreling in our home. To be a quarrel-free marriage. We got brainwashed and indoctrinated very early. Those of us that follow people like Kenneth Hagin, he shared that in their, all their years of marriage, I don't remember how many years they were married, but many, many years, they mentioned that it was quarrel-free. A lot of our mentors also mentioned that. So we also dreamt that we must have a quarrel-free marriage. It doesn't mean we don't disagree, we disagree. When she first came to my house, she was a Chelsea fan. Imagine. <laughs> That's a big disagreement. Why? This I house is a Manchester City house. <laughs> but she gave it up. She has agreed I now. She's a good woman. So we, there, are issues. <laughs> there are issues to disagree on. But we agreed that it must never lead to a quarrel. There must never be insults in this home. Never be violence or aggression in this home. We can disagree and still uh, be cordial and be, uh, be, be agreeable. Yes, and be civil and be yeah. agreeable. It mustn't lead to idiot, bastard. If they burn you were across this place. <laughs> it must never, it must never. So we've had a quarrel-free marriage for the 18 years we've been married. <laughs> we, hallelujah. Totally quarrel-free. No insulting, no pushing, no shoving, nothing like that. All right? So um, that was an agreement we had. And we said, look, two of us can't be mad at the same time. If one person is very, very upset and heated up, the other person needs to back down. Yeah. Till a later time. Yeah. You know, it takes two people to fight. Yeah. That's what happens. So, you, pride. Say, how can you? How can you? And both of you want to hold your ground. Then it leads to a fight. So, we have both agreed. There are times I'm very upset, she just backs down. At times she's very upset, I just back down. See, for that date. <laughs> <And> we <could. laughs> so, we agree, we must not be both angry at the same time. We can't be that angry at the same time. I also yes. think, to be honest, I also think we're too lazy to fight. <laughs> that's, just, that's the way I see oh, it. Oh, because, because I can beat you. You cannot beat me. You know your mate. You now. know that you cannot beat me. <laughs> <laughs> Men will not talk about matter for outside. <laughs> you She's strong, ah, though. When we used to me. play, we play boy scout play and all those guys play on the bed. <laughs> She's strong, though. <laughs> ah. <laughs> you know those people that can beat their wife easily? <laughs> me, I didn't respect myself. Oh. <laughs> She's very strong, though. Okay. I'm going to okay, play. When she hold her, I'm going to play. I said, put down, I'll play. Oh. <laughs> As you play, you know. Uh, oh my God, that day I laughed so hard. He said, ah, why are you only like this? Will I play? Oh. I'm like, ah, let me just make it clear. He said, you know, if he beats me, oh, I go wound <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. Okay, um, another agreement that we had was that we would be intentional with our intimacy. And what that meant was that we put a law in the house that Whenever one, other, one person is leaving the house, even if it is just to go outside the house and go and start the car or something, you can't leave the house without kissing each other. So it may sound like, a, yes, yes, yes. So it's a law. <laughs> it's a rule in the house. You don't step out of the house without kissing. Even the Bible says greet each other with a holy kiss. So we had scriptural backing. <laughs> Why? Somebody um, are laughing a bit more than... <laughs> 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 so we're very, 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 very intentional about it. You don't step out of the house without kissing. Sometimes, what's the case? In a hurry, if you forget. So as he's just gonna, I was like, ah, is that how we behave now? 
He knows he has to come back and kiss me. And sometimes he has to now pay for his sins by making it two instead of one. Because, I mean, if we didn't even know how... You, the truth is that you don't know how, how, Im, how impactful this is. One of the things it will do is that it will teach you to manage your emotions. Because there's no clause that when you're upset, you don't kiss. No, whether you are angry or not, you are stepping out of you have to come back and kiss me. It will just so... It really helps us to manage our emotions... Um, it really helps us to train ourselves. If you can do what you, you are supposed to do when you don't feel like doing it, it really helps you to build your, your discipline. And we didn't even know how, how far, how deep this has gone until one day, I think it was during COVID, Pascal was going to play tennis and I was in the kitchen. And my first daughter was with her friend. At the time, she was about 10. That's what I was about 10 then, right? Two years ago, yeah. She was, she was on the dining with her friend. And so when Pasquale came downstairs with his tent, so I was in the kitchen, he walked, I just overheard two of them, I didn't even know what they were laughing about, I just overheard two of them saying, wait, wait, you see, you see. When Pasquale kissed me, she said, you see, I told you. I'm like, is that what people are doing with your time? You're watching whether daddy and more people kiss. And my, my son at the time was maybe, maybe they were like five or something or six, I can't remember. He said, no, they said you would do you, that, joining your head, joining your head. <laughs> he didn't know what kissing was. He was like, you would do joining your head, joining your head. But interestingly, we're, we're teaching our children that intimacy is normal without being conscious of it. Some yeah. of you have never seen your parents kiss and you are in your 40s. Oh. Even <laughs> hug. You've never ever seen them hug. And that's not healthy. Interestingly, it's not healthy. So we're very intentional with our intimacy. My own last one, number nine, last one for today. Um, we agreed early on in our marriage that the rule in this marriage is that nobody looks out for themselves. So my job is to look out for her. Her job is to look out for me. It's from First Corinthians 7 where it said the job of the husband is to please his wife. And the job of the wife is to see that she pleases her husband. This helps you to be more selfless and less selfish. So everything I'm always thinking is how does it benefit you? How will it make your life easier? How will it make you more comfortable? If you see us dragging for something, most of the drag we drag is about who we take it, who we give who. If there's one piece of meat left, is you take it. Can there's I, a you I take it. That? Yes. So I had. Uh, so what my my PA, my former PA. Oh, she's, she's my still PA. Technically she's still your technically PA, my but she's PA. Married now. But she just got married and moved out of Lagos. <laughs> but at the time, she used to live with me in my house. And so one day. Pasquale was eating, and there was this last piece of meat. So, we're, no, we're eating together. We're Somebody. eating together. So there was one more piece of meat. And so Pasquale says, do you want the meat? I said, no, you can have it. He now says, no, you can have it. No, you can have it. Went on for almost like a minute. The girl said, please, can I just have it? <laughs> 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 because she was done. She was like, ah. and she just rolled her eyes and said, relationship people. Which ones you can have, you can have, you can have. It. Let me just have it then. <laughs> so I mean, we do those kind of things. Go ahead. Yeah. So that was our basic our rule. So we look out for each other, and, and that helps you become conscious of your partner's needs. And I won't lie, oh, me, I've benefited. When you marry somebody that is really caring, you gain a lot for that kind of deal. So I've gotten a lot of the things. My first uh, motorcycle. Okay, I had a motorcycle when I was single, a smaller one. But my the, my big motorcycle I bought when I was married. My wife was the one that bought it for me. You know, yeah, so, yeah. I used to have a very massive, I don't know if there are bikers here, but it was an 1800cc Suzuki Boulevard, massive bike, you know. So things like that. So now so I'm looking at some sports cars that I like. <laughs> yes. You know. Yeah, so when you have uh, this kind of deal, you flex very well. And the good thing is that she doesn't like, there are not, there are not many things she likes. They are not, and even when she likes things, they are not so expensive. <laughs> so I'm balling. <laughs> I'm balling. Because me, things I like are big, big things. And she's always capable. She's always very committed and interested in making sure I get what I want. Trust me, it's such a beautiful thing when both of you look out for each other. You know, many couples is exactly the opposite of that. There's so much self-centeredness going on. It's always about me, 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 me. And that's what breaks many marriages. Be more focused on pleasing and serving the other person. How will I make your life easier? How can I serve you? How can I make you happy? And we even constantly ask ourselves, that, are you happy? Is there something you want me to be doing for you? Are you happy? We, it's a constant question in our house. Are you happy? So make it, make it a tradition in your own house. So that way you can talk and say, well, these are the things I don't like. These are the things I like. And you keep on doing it. All right. Okay. And the final one for today is that one of the major agreements we had was that our marriage would be word ruled. Well, that means that only what the Bible says goes in our marriage. Because we were very clear on the fact that we're building a kingdom marriage. 
So we knew exactly what we wanted. Half, almost all our, in fact, all our decisions were made for us from the Bible. The Bible says love, love. The Bible says the leader must serve, serve. The Bible says respect, respect. The Bible says you should look out for each other, look out for each other. Say submit one to another, submit. So it was very easy for us and very clear, you know. So everything the Bible says is what we do. Our hearts are not hardened towards the word of God at all. Once we find that instruction, we get into it. And I saved our life a lot of times. Um, it's easy to... It's easy to do marriage if you do what Jesus says. Very easy. And that was from that marriage at Canaan. The very first thing Mary said to them was, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And that has been the, the, the foundation scripture for our marriage. That whatever he tells you to do, do it. So we've always been in the word. If we're even unclear, as we're not sure about something, we just go to the word and say, what yeah. does the word say about it? And how can we apply it to our marriage? And it has really, really helped us. And the fact that we know that God hates divorce has also helped us yeah, to ensure work. that we hate divorce. <laughs> it's not even an option for us. So making our marriage word ruled has, yeah. was one of the major, and it's really, really helped us. And I think every couple should do that. And it's, it's beautiful when both, both, both people already respect the word of God. I've never had to tell my wife, you know the Bible says you must submit. Never had to do that. She knows what the Bible says. I know what the Bible says. And we're both endeavoring to do what the Bible says. Even before we met and married. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? 